Welcome to the Friday Casebook, our weekly look at what happened in the world last week. Roger, who or what is the elephant in the room? Well, one of the things that we haven't been talking about enough generally, I think, is the problem of violence against women. Now, before the pandemic, the UN uh, published reports saying that one in three women have uh, experienced uh, at some point in their life physical uh, violence or violence of some kind against their person. So what do we think has been going on during the pandemic? You can imagine that uh, situations were already very, very tense. And of course, there's absolutely no excuse whatsoever uh, for uh, violence, especially violence against women. I think awareness is absolutely key. I think it's not just women that need to be aware of this issue, it's men who need to be aware of this issue. It's not just women who need to be speaking up about this issue, it's men who need to be speaking up about this issue as well. There's um, some very good work being done by the European Union in this area, also in a global context, the Spotlight Initiative with the United Nations, but also many projects across the European Union, including the Marvov project, which focuses on older women, violence against older women, that's the Marvov uh, project. We're coming up to World Awareness Day about violence against older women. That's on the 15th of June. And I think everybody needs to, everybody needs to speak out. It's also the 10th anniversary of the Istanbul Convention, which is a Council of Europe uh, convention. The Council of Europe were meeting in 2011 in Istanbul, which is why it's called the Istanbul Convention. We know that Turkey have marked the 10th anniversary of the Istanbul Convention by pulling out of the Istanbul Convention. But let's remember that Hungary has not ratified the Convention. And let's remember that there are places like Poland where even if the legal mechanisms are in place, the judicial environment is so hostile that it's very difficult if you are a woman who has uh, suffered uh, violence, even if theoretically you have the rights and the laws are in place, to actually access your rights and actually seek justice. And that's another issue as well. And I think there is something that we can all do. I mean, it used to be the case 20, 30 years ago where um, if you heard a, a woman scream from a private house, you would walk by and people would think you should walk by on the other side of the road. That's a, that's, a, that's a family matter. That's not something for us. Of course, that's changed. And, you know, we need to remember that. We need to take this a step further. There's still much further to go. It's all of our concern if there are violence against women. It's not a family matter. It's not a domestic matter. It's a matter for the law. And we all need to speak out. On the occasion of 15th of June, World Awareness Day about violence against older women in particular. But let's remember the pandemic has also caused an epidemic of uh, domestic violence. Much of it we still haven't seen, but it's been there. And uh, we need more of a focus on this. Thank you, Roger, for raising this issue of violence against women. What else caught your eye this week? What's been in the news as well this, this week has been the story of little Artin. This is, uh, this is Artin. He uh, was uh, washed up on uh, uh, a beach in uh, Norway and identified through the blue uh, jacket with white stitching that he was uh, wearing, which uh, he also had been seen wearing in a refugee camp in Calais because Artyom was part of a family of five, had a brother and a sister, age six and age nine, who uh, lost their lives when their uh, boat capsized, uh, trying to, for the third time, trying to get across from Calais to the UK. And he started life in the mountains in Iran. He, his family were Kurdish. Uh, they were in a terrible situation. They left Iran in August last year and traveled across Europe. And, what strikes me about this story is he, what, what, what a lovely little boy he was. And apparently he was the life and soul of the refugee camp. Everybody loved him. He had such a friendly face and always a smile on his face and brought joy to everybody. And what a, what a, tra what a tragic uh, end to his short life. And it reminds me of, you remember Alan, who washed up on a beach in Greece in 2016 and that launched a kind of wave of compassion around the world that, um, ultimately led to Angela Merkel allowing uh, one million Syrian refugees to come into Germany, which by the way has been 
as I understand it, a, a huge uh, a huge success from many many points of, of view. I mean, there's no individual to blame for the death of Artin, but I think we all need to reflect on the type of society that we have today in 2021. Uh, let's speak out about Artin. Let's speak out about the uh, terrible situation in uh, other countries that drives people to leave. Um, it's, it's all very well saying we just make it very difficult for people, but people are in such terrible situations in the first place that however much deterrence you put in place, you're, you're never going to stop people leaving. Our team's life was ended because they had to, this family had to take the, take the action of trying to travel to, to, to across Europe and then ultimately to the UK illegally. We need to have safe and legal routes so that people who are eligible for asylum are, are, do not have to put themselves in the hands of smugglers, do not have to put themselves in harm's way, and do not have to end up uh, dead um, uh, with their son washed up on a beach in Norway uh, in, the, in the future. We, we, we have to address that. Who's on the naughty step, Roger? Well, the person on the naughty step this week, Andrei Babis, is the Prime Minister of uh, the Czech Republic, and um, uh, he doesn't want to have safe and legal routes into Europe. In fact, he said he, he doesn't want to have a single refugee in the Czech Re Republic. Um, he's also uh, uh, somebody who thinks that the idea of a green deal and protecting the environment is a kind of uh, EU fanaticism and we sh he shouldn't have anything to do with it. Uh, there's an election in the Czech Republic in October. I hope he won't be the Prime Minister anymore after that. And he's on the naughty step, Lena, but he's not on the naughty step for those reasons this week. He's on the naughty step because, remember we were talking about Laura Cavesi, the European Public Prosecutor last week. Well, he, he, she's uh, going to be looking forward to looking at the Babis file because the Czech Republic have sent the file to her. And what is the Babis file? It's about the famous, well, I don't know if it is famous. I don't know if our viewers have heard of it yet, but we're going to hear about it now. The Stork's Nest scandal. The Stork's Nest is actually a building that looks just like that, like a, a stork's nest. And it's attached to a farm in the Czech Republic, which is owned by uh, agrofets. In fact, the um, inside this building that looks like that stork's nest is, and that's attached to this farm. So you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, What's wrong with that? It seems to be that uh, the EU have paid for it. You might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, the EU subsidy was supposed to go to uh, small and medium sized businesses. And uh, so what, but in fact, this, um, this Stork's Nest uh, farm is owned by Agrofets, which is a huge uh, conglomerate. Um, and guess who the owner of that is? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Babel is a very uh, has a very big stakeholding and controlling interest, as I understand it. So, how did um, Agrofets manage to get a, uh, a million pound subsidy to build this farm? And the answer seems to be that they sold it to a small and medium sized enterprise controlled by Mr. Babel and his family, uh, got the EU subsidy, and then bought it back again. <laughs> <laughs> so the interesting thing is that this has come up again because this was looked at two years ago and now it's come up uh, again. But I would, um, I would think this would be an early test case for how effective Laura Cavesi and her team of prosecutors at the European Public Prosecutor's uh, Office uh, are. And this is, it seems to me, I, I don't want to sort of uh, interfere with the, uh, we don't want to interfere with the, uh, the legal case, but it seems, but the issue here is a clear conflict of interest. And it seems uh, to me to be far too easy if you are a rich and powerful individual with uh, no scruples. And I'm not sure saying that that's Mr. Babbins's case, but we will know whether or not that's the case once Lara Cabezzi has done her investigation. So that's very good that it can go to her. Um, if you are a uh, you know a, a, a rich powerful individual uh, in Europe it seems to me far too easy to exploit the system and let's hope that Lara Cavesi can tell us uh, find out what's happened and if there has been fraud um, take the appropriate action and punish him. Now I wonder 
Was there also a bright spot this week? Who's our star of the week? Our star of the week is Philippe, uh, Philippe Marquez. He's a uh, Portuguese judge and he's also the uh, president of Medel. Philippe is very active uh, across Europe with his association, Magistrat European pour la liberté et la démocratie, um, in defending the rule of law uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, he, there are 18,000 magistrates involved in his association altogether, and they've been, uh, as we've covered on this program, very active in relation to issues to do with the rule of law in Poland. And I'm delighted to say that uh, Philippe is going to be the speaker this year at the New Europeans AGM on the 23rd of June. What's coming up? We've talked a lot about the Conference on the Future of Europe and the uh, plenary, the first plenary session uh, of the Conference on the Future of Europe is uh, due to take place on the 19th of June in uh, Strasbourg. Uh, the day before is the anniversary of New Europeans, uh, the eighth anniversary of New Europeans on the 18th of June. And we'll be involved in a, a big meeting in the European Parliament actually as a co-host uh, on European citizenship rights to celebrate uh, the 18th of June, our eighth anniversary, on the eve of the first plenary session on the Conference on the Future of Europe. And remember, if you're interested in making your voice heard uh, during the Conference on the Future of Europe, get in touch, join New Europeans as a member. We will help you to work out how, how it works, how you can make your contribution and to make your voice heard. Thank you very much, Roger, for this Friday casebook. And dear all, thank you so much for watching. Roger and I will come back in September with a Friday casebook. Keep tuned in, watch videos over the summer, and we look forward to seeing you in September. Thanks for your support.